Paul Flippen. I'm a professor in the Department of Sociology here at Penn, and also the director of uh, Penn's Center for the Study of Ethnicity, Race, and Immigration, SERI. SERI was founded about five years ago with the purpose of stimulating, uh, you know, cutting edge research in areas of ethnicity, race, immigration, and bringing together to foster collaboration of uh, people interested in this area. So one of the things that we do is plan and sponsor the events that bring together, um, you know, the, the most preeminent scholars um, and experts on a given topic together in conversation to advance research in the area. And this is a, a prime example of that, uh, the speakers that we have today. Um, this is also the first time that SERI has collaborated with the Center for Latin American and Latinx Studies. So I want to thank Julia Paleta here for helping to build that bridge between these two centers. I hope that this will be the first of many fruitful collaborations in the years ahead. Um, I wanted to give also a brief word of thanks to the people who made this event possible. So Ann Kalbach um, at SERI, and also Kathy Barch, uh, Ana Gabriela Jimenez at Clouds. Um, and last but certainly not least, I want to make sure to both thank and introduce Maria Tuesta. Uh, Maria is the inaugural postdoctoral fellow at Clouds. Um, she earned her PhD in urban planning at Harvard, and her research examines the dynamic relationship between space and community, especially how forced migrants access housing and forged, uh, forged communities in Colombia. She was, uh, without a doubt, the driving force behind putting this event together. We would not be here without her. She really spearheaded all of the most difficult uh, planning and coordination. So thank you so much, and I will turn the floor over to Maria. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thanks uh, for speaking to speakers to be here. I'm super excited to hear all of you because you're an inspiration to me. So thank you. So um, this is a very important event about Canadian migration to the Americas. Our two centers, the Center for Latin American and Latinx Studies and the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity and Immigration came together in October actually last year to organize this event. With a sharp increase of Haitian migration in the past two years, knowing that tens of thousands of Haitian migrants were waiting at the US-Mexico border, many of them to be deported back to Haiti after undertaking ethnic journeys all throughout the Americas, some coming from the far south in, in Chile, through the jungle of the Darien Gap at the border between Colombia and Panama, and up to the US, we realized that we needed better understandings of migration pathways facing many families and individuals who are forced to leave their homes. So with this goal in mind, we decided to organize this symposium with a focus of attention in Haiti, its past, its present, and its future, the structural factors that help us understand migration from Haiti today, the challenges and experiences of contemporary migrants, and the steps that civil society and governments can undertake to support them. So I hope that, that in this symposium, we can think about Haiti not only as it generally comes to our minds as an island in the Caribbean Ocean, but rather as a moving territory connecting national, political, economic, and social histories with individual migration journeys, transnational relations that bring Haiti to the US Venezuela, the Darien Gap, or Chile, among, among other geographical locations. So with this, let me give the floor to Fernando Chagmui, the moderator of our panel, our first panel. Fernando is the Thomas O'Boyle Lecturer in Law at the Penn Law School, where he teaches international human rights and U.S. refugee law. At Penn's Graduate School of Social Policy and Practice, he teaches separate courses on U.S. law and policy, overview as well as courses on U.S. immigration law. And before coming to Penn, he served as the former legal officer with the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. So, thank you very much for Gracias, gracias, Maria. Thank you all for coming, and um, congratulations again to the centers. 
for um, bringing us all together. And thanks to our guests, who are going to in a few seconds. But Maria, you must have the power of prophecy because um, way back in October, you knew that this was an important conference to bring together. And what I mean by that is, in in the summer um, of 2021, all of our attention was on Afghanistan's Afghanis crossing barbed wire and trying to get into the airport. But then we forgot that when in the fall, we saw horrifying pictures of American immigration authorities on horseback hitting patients. And then we forgot that when six weeks ago, just before spring break, uh, Ukraine hit the news. So we forgot the Afghan, we forgot the patients, and now all our attention is on um, Ukraine. So thank you, Maria, and the two centers for bringing us back to put the spotlight back on, on Haiti. Um, so as I introduce our guests, uh, who are going to be talking about the challenges of immigrants, especially Haitians in the Haitian diaspora, I want to acknowledge that this room that we're in, the forum, and this building, sits in, which is in West Philadelphia, sits on land that was occupied by the Lenape nations. And then immigrants from the United Kingdom, Britain came and claimed it for England, uh, William Penn, in Pennsylvania. And so in the context of, our, of acknowledging the land that we're sitting, we remember those who came and were not stopped from entry. And today we're going to talk about um, new immigrants who are stopped from entry. So our guests, we have one guest, um, Namira, you have a beautiful big face and a big screen. Um, let me introduce uh, Namira Duchet Prosper, who is a professor at the University of California at Irvine. All of our speakers, their uh, extensive bios are in the book, but I do want to highlight a couple of things. Um, Namira is a founding member of the Black Radical Media Collective, um, and she's an international coordinator for the Pan African Solidarity Network. Um, one thing that's not in the book is her most recent accomplishment. She has a brand new research assistant, otherwise known as a new baby. So, congratulations, Manira. To my right is Garavini Joseph, who um, is co founder and executive director of the Haitian Bridge Alliance, um, a national grassroots nonprofit community organization. It was really hard to pin down Garavini to prepare for this um, talk. But as some of us say, the reason she was busy is because she was doing God's work. She was, I think you were in Cameroon when we were trying to get a hold of you. Um, but anyway, she's doing incredible advocacy work on behalf of Haitian, Haitian diaspora. And she's the recipient of the Robert Kennedy um, Human Rights Award and the Father Jean Just Award given to her by the uh, National Haitian American Elected Officials. Congratulations. And on um, my right, is um, Alex Dupree, who is the professor uh, emeritus at um, Resnian. He's published numerous books and texts and numerous articles. During break, if you ask Max, that he might give you his autograph, because he's appeared on Jim Blair's um, Hour, he's appeared on Anderson Cooper, and if you're familiar with Toronto TV, he's appeared on Steve Parkins Toronto, Toronto Public TV. So we're going to make this as interactive as possible. We're going to ask bunches of questions to our panelists. Um, and we're going to talk about the past, the present, the future, and what next. Then it will be like 3.15 or 3.30, and then break. So let me begin with Alice. Alice, given your extensive scholarly experience, could you share with us what could be a 14-week course on Haiti? But could you share with us why, let's say, from the 1990s to the 2000s, people left Haiti? And then I'm going to turn it over to um, Amira to bring us to the present. But give us a brief overview of the Peace Center. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate the, uh, us, the Center for Ethnicity, Race, and Immigration, and the Center for American and Latin Latinx uh, Studies for inviting me to participate. I, to answer the question, let me just first just give you some basic data. Uh, currently, it's estimated that about close to 20% of the Asian population lives abroad. Uh, Two million or so Asians out of the population of 11 million. Uh, 
Um, of those, 705,000 live in the United States, 496,000 in the Dominican Republic, 237,000 in Chile, 343,000 in Brazil, 101,000 in Canada, 85,000 in France, 30,000 in the Bahamas, 22,000 in French Guiana, 16,000 in Turks and Caicos Islands, and 34,000 in Guadeloupe. So, uh, for me, to understand Haitian immigration, we have to understand that it's principally a 20th century phenomenon. During the 19th century, immigration, Haitians migrated from one region to another in, in Haiti, but not abroad. The only real people who emigrated were dictators who were overthrown from power. So they would go abroad for in, in this island. Um, and, but that began to change in the 20th century with the U.S. occupation of Haiti from 1915 to 1934. And when I say this, what I mean is that during the 19th century, the majority of Haitians were farmers. And they had access to land, obviously, to cultivate the foods and the crops that they produced, both for the rest of the subject, for their own consumption, and also for export. That began to change drastically during the 20th century when the U.S. occupied Haiti and began to expropriate farmers from their land to establish new forms of production, primarily for exports, such as sugar, bananas, mangoes, and so on, copper and uh, aluminum that they have to, to extract. And those tens of thousands of peasants who were expropriated now have began to emigrate first to the um, uh, center of the capital city, other major cities to find wage labor and employment. They were first employed in U.S. companies and U.S. Uh, uh, businesses, and also in Haitian businesses that were uh, functioning in the major cities. But also it began a process of the declining of agriculture, which began to now reach a significant level in the mid 20th century. And and led, began to lead to the process of migration. That what sparked much migration first was the United States began to export Haitian labor to the Dominican Republic to work primarily on the sugar industry in the Dominican Republic, which still today is a, is relies on Haitian immigrant labor to produce the cane that it exports to the United States. The U.S. also began to export Haitians to Panama Canal, and so that began a process that became a continuous process fueled now by the repression of the Duranian regime and the continued the policies of the IMF, World Bank, and so on. I'm going to pass over a long history here, but to give you a summary, those policies implemented in made by the IMF to World Bank also began to destroy Haitian agriculture. For example, up to the 1950s, 60s, Haiti used to be self-sufficient in rice production. When the IMF began, and the World Bank and so on began to implement their policies, it destroyed Haitian rice production to the point where now Haiti imports most of its rice from the U.S. It is no longer able to produce that crop, which was a major source of income for, for peasants. So the migration began, and to me, to understand migration in this context is to understand it primarily as a labor problem. It is a capitalist economy. In a capitalist economy, if you don't own land, if you don't own property and can't produce for your own survival, the only way you can do that is to sell your labor. When you expropriate tens of thousands of workers and you don't have the, the possibility of employing them in domestic industries, you begin the process of exporting them to labor, it becomes a self sustaining process. Where more migrants now see, well, more Haitians now who cannot find means of employment at home are now looking to do so abroad. 
This is what has fueled the migration of all these countries that I've talked about because of the possibility that they could then uh, have access to, to jobs and so on. And another factor that is tied to, to the immigration process is now the remittances that Asians abroad now send to Haiti, which today represent about 20% of Haiti's GDP. But the remittances serve not only as a source of survival for the families that die, where more than 30, up, up, upward of 30% of Asian families now rely on those remittances, remittances to survive, but it also fuels immigration. Because the remittances now allow people to see, okay, I can now go abroad and have opportunities to also earn a living and support my family since I can't do that at home. If you read Marx, he made exactly the same response, the same argument for Irish labor when they were being forced to leave Ireland to not only come to the United States but also to Britain because of the destruction of Irish agriculture as a result of the famine that was induced by the British. So I said, long story, I don't want to get sidetracked here. But I'm saying Haiti is not unique here in that process. It is a process that is directly related to the question of labor. When labor cannot be satisfied, the demand for labor cannot be satisfied domestically. Workers cannot find it as well way to buy it. Only alternative to them is to find it elsewhere. Hence, that's what fuels. Thank you, Alex. So, Ramiro, you just heard the beginning of emigration of a cause being U.S. occupation, um, the tiny agriculture, depression, the, the IMF, capitalism, and selling of labor. Can you bring us up to the present? And in your research and in your work with the community, um, has anything changed over the last five or ten years? We're all looking at you uh, beautifully. Thank you. Uh, so thank you again for having invited me, invited me and for tolerating, you know, more screen time and this in-person um, epoch that we're re-entering. I'm very happy to share the panel with um, Gerlin and Alex, and I will be also pulling from the work of Alex Dupuis and, and the work of folks like Gerlin Joseph, um, who are underground. So I just wanted to say that, you know, when we think about the Haitians showing up um, at Del Rio, Texas, right, the media portrays that moment as some kind of um, exception. And, you know, Gerlin will speak to this, I'm sure, but we had already heard about Haitians being part of the migrant caravans, quote unquote, in 2018, alongside Nicaraguans, Cubans, Venezuelans, Congolese, Angolans, Cameroonians, and Bangladeshi who had arrived in California on many to be deported or interned in overcrowded concentration camps, right? Adding to the 2.3 million surplus populations already in cage in US territories. And many people attributed this Haitian um, for addition to the caravan to the recent assassination of um, de facto President Jovenel Moise and the earthquake in August. However, these events, you know, were uh, too, recent to have produced this wave of migration, and as I'm sure Gerlin will cover and we'll come back to it with um, Alex, but these folks had been coming from, had walked hundreds, um, thousands of miles, right, across 11 countries to get to this border from Chile, from Brazil, so there's a much longer history, and at the same time that in that summer, hundreds of Haitians had walked through from Chile, 311 countries, Right, their compatriots in Haiti had organized the first Pei Luck, which some have called general strike that eventually launched a wave of protests over the next three years. So by October of 2018, when the migrant caravans had reached the border, hundreds of thousands of Haitians were marching throughout multiple cities in the Caribbean country asking, put cob peto caribea, where is the peto caribe money? Different sectors of Haiti. Yes. Ah. Okay, I can speak up. Can you hear me better now? Slightly. Slightly. Okay, this is as loud as I can get on my end. I can try to project more. Yeah. Okay. 
So um, I don't know how, you know, what was, what was not heard, but by October of 2018, by the time that these migrant caravans were reaching the border in California, hundreds of thousands of Haitians were marching throughout multiple cities in the Caribbean country asking, where is the Caribe money? Different sectors of Haitian society had gathered to demand the rendition of the Caribe account since the agreement had been signed in 2008 or more than $2 billion of public monies earmarked for social projects such as housing, infrastructure, and agriculture. So they denounced state corruption and impunity, and some radical militants called for a total rupture with the system of inequality and exploitation, the one that Alex is already drawing up for us by what they called, what they qualified as Xavier Chaudier, right? So to uproot the system, to overthrow the system. And so these protests, were an expression of the people's rejection of the core group in Poe's election of Jovenel Moïse. And I had hoped that um, Alex would get to the 2004 moment. And I think that's an important, pivotal um, time in Haitian history where you see what some of us are calling right, a, a much more um, naked recolonization of Haiti um, with the overthrow um, of Aristide from power in 2004, which also marked the 200th anniversary of the Haitian Revolution, and really what is a full-blown occupation um, headed by Brazil and Chile. So when we start thinking about why are Haitians migrating to Brazil and Chile, these are the connections, these are the roots. This is the moment that Haitians start turning to Brazil as a possible um, place to migrate. Um, but also are being recruited, right? Brazil is essentially thinking about um, how to reposition itself, right? As a position itself as a global power emerging as a G20. Um, and they have these huge um, development projects, if you will, right? Thinking about things like, for example, the World Cup, the Olympics, right? These stadiums have to be built. And as Alex pointed out, right, Haitians are considered the um, cheapest labor force in the region. So thinking about Haiti, not just isolated, right, as we typically have um, understood it, or uh, right, really thinking about it as part of the region and understood that way, Haiti has the lowest minimum wages, right, and Haitians are often recruited to work elsewhere. And usually because, right, they won't have the kind of um, protections to the law, right, because they're not citizens, but also because they're understood as the cheapest labor. And we can talk about the racialized aspects of this um, making of the cheap labor. But essentially, these Haitians are going to Brazil, and there's extensive work coming out of Brazilian universities by Haitian um, diasporic folks on this migration pattern. I'm a little less on Chile, but that's coming up. And, you know, so folks are going first to Brazil and crossing over to Chile. And that has to do with this 2004 moment and this imposition of UN troops in Haiti, um, so-called to bring peace. And you know we could go through uh, all of what the UN has done or really has not done in Haiti if we have time for that. But the, the part of what happens also is that you have the imposition of the core group, which is essentially a council that's formed of the United States, Canada, France, um, Brazil, of course, is there, Germany, Spain, the UN, and the OAS, right? So all of these different um, entities have a representative on the core group. They operate out of the U.S. Embassy. And essentially, they begin to more blatantly, more openly control elections. And you see in 2010, there's this opportunity with the earthquake to bring about the PHTK, the Paltia y Sientet Cali. I call them, for short, the, the bald heads. Um, and if any fans of Bob Marley here will think about that reference, maybe. But um, essentially, these folks are ushered into power. Many of them are, you know, self-declared neo duvalierists and they're bringing about a similar plan to what we had seen in the Duvalier of the, you know, when Duvalier says in 1969 he wants to turn um, Haiti and make it the Taiwan of the Caribbean. So thinking about Haiti along four axes of development. We're talking about industrial parks, we're talking about mining, so mining of gold, mining of silver and other um, minerals, right? There had been many, much research done in the 70s, you know, through UN um, agencies under the Duvalier about uh, the resources underground that Haiti has. So this is part of the vision for so-called development. 
You also have agribusiness, right? So Cointreau, Grand Marnier, they have huge plantations producing oranges, for example, to make these drinks. Um, and, you know, less so tourism, right? Um, that's also part of this axis of development. And it, it's very reminiscent of what Duvalier's vision, so-called vision was for development in Haiti. So the folks who are protesting at that time, right, are protesting at that point, eight years, uh, or seven years of PHCK being in power, having already had Michel Martelly and under Michel Martelly, two thirds of these um, Petro-Caribe monies were essentially squandered, stolen. And so I'm not sure where I am for time, um, but I, I'd like for us to, to spend a little time if we can later on this 2004 moment and how there are certain rearrangements that are taking place in the region and the importance of Haiti in that picture um, and the importance of certain laws that come to pass, for example, the 2006 and later on 2008 HELP Acts, um, they're you know, essentially extensions of the Caribbean Basin Initiative of 1983. And they allow for duty-free access from Haiti to the US of various apparel products for Gap, Walmart, and Levi's to name a few. These privileges essentially get extended to the Dominican Republic as well. Um, and meanwhile, minimum wages stayed stagnant. So when we think about migration of Haitians out of Haiti, we have multiple decades, right? Where we have this repeated pattern of political instability that's usually driven right by imperialist um, desires and, and machinations and the recruitment of Haitians to work elsewhere, but also the, the, the maintenance of minimum wages uh, very low in the country towards also extraction, right? So as Alex was saying, you had a very rural, very agricultural based country. And when you look at the ways that the PHCK specifically since 2010 started, portraying this land, right? Even Jovenel Moïse says, oh, we have, you know, 65,000 hectares of land as if there are no people living there, right? As if there are, there's no life already on the, this land. They essentially saw the land as empty, saw the people, and, and, and I have a piece where I look at how even um, magazines who are trying to attract investors portray the land as empty and also that the people are there so eager to work, right? That Haitians want to be workers on land that they used to produce and live on and that essentially are evicted out of to, in order to put, right, these um, hundreds of acres of so-called development projects. So people are being driven off the land. And there are countless stories and I could raise one um, that sort of begins the story of the Peashtika after the earthquake when in the Northeast, instead of actually rebuilding and reconstruction, reconstructing the parts of Haiti that have been affected by the 2010 earthquake, they're looking at the Northeast, not affected physically by the earthquake. And they essentially evict what turns out to be 3,500 people, right? So hundreds of families off of this land, Chabel Plantation, which to talk about the U.S. occupation, this is where Shalman Peralt had been imprisoned. And Shalman Peralt is one of the um, resistors of U.S. occupation in the early 20th century, right? So just to think about the continual story of oppression and dispossession in that same place. And these folks are dispossessed and their promised compensation that never comes. And eventually they do organize into a collective to demand, um, obviously to demand compensation. And at, on that same land, you have this Caracol Industrial Park producing for Levi's and Gap that enjoys the low minimum wage. And if anybody's paying attention, right, this is a, since the beginning of the year, folks are out um, and they're protesting minimum wage and asking for, you know, five times more what it, what, what it used to be in order to match the rate of living. But these are the reasons that folks are moving. They're being evicted, but also, right, these folks are um, continually subject to these low minimum wages when they are able to find jobs. And this is, and the reason they're going to Brazil and Chile is connected to this 2004 moment in the occupation um, by UN troops headed by Brazil and Chile. And, you know, I, I could go on, but the Piaschika are instrumental because one of the first uh, moments of migration to Brazil that has been noted is 2008, right? And then you see, um, I remember being in Haiti, doing field work, living in Haiti again, 2012, 2013, and seeing young, men and women just sitting outside the, the airport waiting to get on these flights to go to Chile. So 
the past year, God definitely deepened and, and allow the vision that the international community, quote unquote, had for Haiti in 2004 to really take root and to really take place. So um, I feel like I've exceeded my five minutes. Yes, you have, but it's been really interesting. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to something Alex said and you said, and that's U.S. role. And we're going to go back to your uh, comments in the era about Brazil, Chile, the United Nations. But let me turn it over to Gurney, who um, has traveled extensively. Uh, and my question to you is, as a follow-up to what we just heard from Alex in Europe, uh, what are your perspectives on whether U.S. policy has helped or not helped um, Haiti, positively or negatively, in the people leaving or staying? What are your perspectives, given your, your lived experience and, and seeing all this? Uh, thank you so much, and, and thank you, Mamira. I'll see you back home <laughs> uh, soon, and, and thank you, Professor Dupree. Uh, you know, we heard a lot of context from both Professor Dupree and, and Mamira, understanding how we get to where we are today. And I want to uh, quickly touch on the earthquake in, 20, in 2010 that killed over 250,000 people that day and leaving a part of the country completely destroyed. And after that, we saw a new wave of forced migration due to, due to uh, natural disasters and um, displacement around, around Port-au-Prince and the surrounding areas. And understanding also migration in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, as we can also, uh, the, the next uh, uh, panel, uh, Professor Fuwa will be able to touch on as well, to show that not only um, Haitians are being forced to migrate due to labor, forced and, and, and um, un unneeded, uh, but making sure people leave, but also for fleeing heat due to political turmoil, due to climate, uh, change, uh, climate uh, uh, change due to misappropriation of funds in Haiti and really look into how U.S. foreign policies impact Haiti as a nation, as a country, and as an idea. Understanding if we go back 250 years ago how Haiti came to be, the very idea, the very existence of Haiti Please understand, it's unacceptable to the West. The fact that you have a group of people from different African tribes put themselves together with native uh, indigenous people and overthrew the biggest, largest, baddest power in the world at the time, create not only an identity and language, an idea that all people should and must be free is unacceptable to the world then, unacceptable to the Congo today. And looking at how U.S. policy influences what we are seeing in Haiti right now, creating a, 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 a system that is with, 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 with violence, with gang violence. And we are seeing, as we heard from Professor Dupree, how you know, in 1915 occupations of Haiti and labor being needed to, to be um, exported to the Dominican Republic, to Cuba, to many places around the world, and seeing how that affects people on the ground today. To be to a point where people only see a future only if they leave Haiti. Whether they are leaving Haiti due to the current political turmoil, where in the country the president is assassinated in his own bedroom. So who is safe, politically thinking, when you are looking at the psyche of the people, when the president is, is, is unable to get the protection, quote unquote, that, that was due to him, so therefore, who can be safely say, I am going to be here, I'm going to stay here. And so we are looking at what I am calling internal violence 
in external violence. And we can also trace the internal violence back to US policies, forcing Haiti to be in a state where we cannot provide for ourselves, where we see poultry industry was completely destroyed by, uh, uh, by US uh, uh, government and industries to make sure that, hey, we can continue to be dependent on outside help. We also remember uh, uh, the, the, the pigs that were native to Haiti were replaced by importing uh, uh, pigs, forcing farmers to not only be unable to support themselves, but completely be dependent on outside sources for survival. Understanding, just looking at, at, at that pandemic where they say they had the disease that they needed to be destroyed, back then, farmers, people from, from the countryside who, who simply rely on raising one pig, two pigs, to be able to then, uh, uh, provide for their families that have been destroyed in the rice uh, uh, acid pandemic. And then lately, they're looking at peanuts. If you grew up in Haiti, if you ever been in Haiti, we understand children after school will get a peanut in Frisco to keep them until they get home to get to their full meal. But by replacing uh, uh, indigenous peanut with uh, uh, NG and M, uh, with, with imported peanut will completely destroy the farming industry Thus, again, see how foreign policies through commerce and other, uh, um, and other ways are negatively impacting Haiti. So that is not only a part of what we are seeing, creating the internal violence, and Haiti continue to export brain power, right, and export ideologies such as gang violence and all of those that are not a part of our culture. And we see external violence when we are looking at um, people coming to the south uh, US-Mexico border, as we saw in the video, when we see men in uniform weeping, black children and their parents asking for support due to political violence uh, uh, and um, uh, labor and, and in all of those things that, that uh, uh, Professor Alex and um, Amira uh, talked about, seeing how we are turning vacations and, and, and really using deportation and expulsion as a way to deter people who are black or brown to come into the United States. So if we were to really look into how US policy are impacted Haitian migration, both internally and forcing people to make their way from Haiti to South America, Central America, and to the United States. We will be here for the entire day. I'm um, going stay here and come back after. Great, thank you. So, so far we've heard, beginning with uh, Professor Dupree talking about the U.S. occupation. Um, Irene has talked about U.S. policy, both for-profit and government policies, having an impact on poultry, pig farming, uh, peanut farming, rice farming, again, all having negative impact. And so now, are we the only bad players in town? And so, um, Mamira alluded to Brazil, Chile, and the United Nations. So the question I'll pose to both Alex and Mamira and Karina, if we have time, is so can we talk about other countries' uh, policies? What's going on in um, Central America, Latin America, the Caribbean? Um, have they, like, what role do they play? And again, Namira started us down that path. What role have other countries, in addition to the United States, what role have they played in the immigration, in the emigration of patients? Do you want to take a stab, Alex, and then I'll turn it over to Namira? Well, you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot more to, to add than what Mamira and Jolene have mentioned. Uh, both Haiti, the export of labor to not only the United States but to the Caribbean and South America is also a problem of unequal access by both domestic and foreign labor to different types of jobs. So, insofar as Asians can be imported 
by countries to work in certain sectors of their economy that the domestic, the citizens of those countries are unable or unwilling to do because either they have access to higher wages or they are citizens of those countries and they can't be treated the same way as foreign labor and foreign labor can. Asians have served that purpose throughout the Central America and, the, and Latin America and the Caribbean. There is another component to Haitian immigration that also began at what Ramiro was suggesting under the Duvalier regime, which previously had not been part of the picture other than uh, unskilled workers emigrating to find jobs elsewhere. It is what is known generally as the brain drain. During the Duvalier regime, as a result of the massive repression that the regime and imposed an act in of Haiti where thousands were being killed, thousands were being jailed. What you had at that time was an exodus of intellectuals, of basically intellectual labor rather than manual labor. That process led Haitians only to go to France and Canada and other parts of the Caribbean, but it also meant that now, even educated Haitians who could not find meaningful employment domestically were now exiting as well. So in addition to the economic policies, which I'll mention also in a minute, one of the devastating consequences that they had, the export of Haitian brain power has been also a constant presence since particularly the value regime and, as was mentioned before, under the IEC government, where many exiled Haitians went back to Haiti because of the promise of a progressive government coming to power first in 1991. IEC was elected by over 60% of the population in 1991. He served seven months in power, he was overthrown by the military went into exile, and with him, and again, an, an exploitation of a significant percentage of the intellectual force of Haiti. I see was returned to Haiti in 2004. Uh, he served three years, was over, again overthrown, overthrown by, by, the, by the military, and Clinton had brought I, the IEC back. And it was when Clinton brought IEC back quid pro quo came primarily where the, the remaining ability of Haitian to produce rice was even further reduced when Clinton demanded as a quid pro quo to return IEC to Haiti that IEC reduce tariff protections on Haitian rice. This led to Haiti now changing its tariffs from about 30% to 3% which devastated the rice production. And even Clinton had a mea culpa, the crocodile kills the mea culpa, said, I have destroyed the Asians' ability to earn their own living. Uh, but it was too late, obviously. And the same thing happened to the pork production. Uh, peasants were expropriated in the north of Haiti to create an assembly plant where Haiti now supplies the cheapest labor for the government. And one of the uh, 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 contracts that Duvalier made with the IMF and the uh, World Bank and so on was that they would keep Haitian labor as the lowest in the entire region. Haitian workers have been going on strike, but again, it was pressed recently, they just went on strike again. And if you can believe it, they were demanding a living wage. But the most the government was able to do was to raise the minimum wage to five dollars a day for an hour and a half. They worked their eight hours. So it, it, again, this is a, a this is what exactly the policies of the IMF, the World Bank, demands that in order to attract investment in Haiti, since they, investments are not coming from Haitian entrepreneurs, they're coming from importers of, of labor, importers of Capital import, capitalists investing in Haiti, 
they want to have access to the cheapest labor force. And when an entrepreneur in Haiti who contracts with the foreign firms to ask why they weren't raising wages, they said, well, why should we? We have about 50% of employment, which means that anything, anything workers get, they don't take. So this is the mentality of the capitalist sectors of the capitalist path in Haiti, combined with their foreign allies, foreign uh, investors, to be put the contract to maintain the the labor process in Haiti as such. When Haitians graduate from university or from high school, they can't find any for the work or employment that pays them a significant wage. They also emigrate. And this is where, so it becomes a vicious, a vicious cycle. Any government that comes to Haiti has to follow the dictates of the foreign investors if they want to attract foreign investors. Given the capacity of the Haitian bourgeoisie to create more employment domestically, then you have this, the problem where you cannot retain, there's not, there's not sufficient demand for labor in Haiti. So it, it's not just a matter of foreign policies, but it's also an, an issue that has to deal with the very nature of the, the economy in Haiti itself and the ability of the ruling class of Haiti to amass millions of dollars with the workers that they have, where there is no interest or necessity for them to invest in creating more production. This is what Harry Singh was trying to change, and Harry Singh himself became a demagogue and so on, and so we won't go there because it's a different story. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, he basically he sold out yeah. uh, and, you know, and dragged the people down because of one of the things, including. Many, many superb, highly educated candidates who were the victims of the promises. So, thank you. I'm just repeating myself. Thank you, Alex. So, yeah, go ahead, uh, Nervin. I just wanted to highlight one thing that for a very long time, a uh, government in Haiti, which is non existent currently, we do not have a government in Haiti right now, has been imposed by U.S. the call group and others. So we have not a quote unquote uh, government in Haiti for a very long time. It has always been puppet government doing the bidding of the, 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 the groups that are holding the country in hostage, whether it is the people in Haiti that you mentioned or the international forces. But before we go to our last question, which is basically going to be what, what do we do? Let me turn it back to Manera. Manera, I know that you focus not only on Haiti, um, but on uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. And so, could you flesh out a little bit more uh, briefly what are the countries, uh, as Berlin just said, international forces, what is their role in, in the Haiti situation and immigration? And then we'll go to the last question, then we'll open it up for reflections or questions from the folks in the room. Yes. Um, so I, I'll say similarly to what um, Alex already brought up. I think in the beginning he gave the stats for you know the number of Haitians in all these different parts of the Americas, and I think that gives us a picture of what players are interested, right, in controlling Haitian migration and also minimum wages. Because as I said before, um, and as Alex has argued, you know, and and his text and in the, and on this panel, right, that the U.S. occupation really reorganizes um, the entire region, really, and particularly the Caribbean. So that's why Caribbean scholars talk about recolonization. They say, right, there's no sovereignty in the Caribbean. So you have to think about Haiti not just isolated by itself, but also in relation to these other spaces, right? And how these transnational, right, we're calling them transnational capitalists today, right, are thinking about the space um, in relation um, to itself. So when the Caracol Industrial Park folks who are actually the South Korean manufacturing company move to Haiti, they're actually coming from Guatemala, which has, I think, the next, you know, lowest minimum wages of the region, right? So these folks really look at the map um, and, and one as one block, right? And they sort of think about the different territories and the roles that are assigned within the larger capitalist system. And Haiti has a particular role. I think Gerlin highlighted a bit for us what that role has been forced to be 
right, since this great offense, which has been the Haitian Revolution, right, to white supremacy and, and the capitalist system. And so Haiti continues to be at the bottom, right, that you need a bottom, essentially, to exist in order to justify the hierarchy of wages, even thinking about, you know, workers who are inside of the target that's selling you the products being made in Haiti, right, are in relationship to um, we have to think of them in relation to the Haitian worker who's actually um, in the factory um, in the Northeast. So, you know, when we're thinking about this 2000, post 2004 moment, and this is why it's not to underplay the role that the earthquake has in 2010 as far as people leaving Haiti, but you already see um, this recolonization producing all kinds of rearrangements in the 21st century again. And I say rearrangements, but it's really, um, a reproduction of some of the same dynamics that already Alex has pointed out, but you know, WikiLeaks, right? Um, we know there are some people who are still in, in prison today for having revealed the truth to us, right? Show that there is correspondence between Hillary Clinton when she's the Secretary of State um, and uh, and the in Preval, right? To say that you need to keep the minimum wages low in 2008 when Parliament is hoping to raise it but not anything that would actually make them livable wages, right? So you have this meddling, particularly of the United, the United States, but you have these other actors, right? Canada and France, who, who and you even see Spain and Germany and, 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 and Brazil, right? So the, the market in Haiti is flooded with Brazilian products, right? Products coming out of Latin America. You certainly see that Colombia has an interest in Haiti, right? The assassination that took place involved you know, Colombian mercenaries and Colombia was ready to say, you know, let's launch another mission and it, it'll be at the head of this mission. Um, Colombia is now in the middle of their elect election process where they're, you know, there's go there may be the first black um, vice president, you know, and woman in power who's a leftist, right? So maybe Colombia will shift, but we saw the role that Haiti played, right? in undermining Nicolas Maduro's election, when Jovenel Moise voted against um, the recognition of his um, government. And you think, you know, Haiti is such a little country, um, how important it is. It's actually, you know, very important geopolitically. There were other smaller islands who were also pressured into voting against Maduro. Um, and this is a pivotal moment um, because again of this Petro Caribe scandal. And, you know, we don't have a chance to talk about it here, but that Venezuela, you know, had this program that essentially, um, was countering U.S. you know as a hegemony on trading, especially around you know this big the oil the 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 gold of our times, right? Oil, and so this was about using Haiti too to undermine the Bolivarian state, right? So whatever opinions we may have about it, right? But we're looking at how there's a geopolitical game being played. And I think, you know, to what Gellian said that I didn't get a chance to say, what the gang violence also is really important to note. Um, and that it's, there were gangs that already existed in the 90s under, under um, sorry, Aristide, but we certainly, the, the level at which the gangs are controlling the territory, particularly the Port-au-Prince metropolitan area, that's unseen. And I grew up in Haiti in the 90s. And this is something brand brand new, right? And so we have to say Haiti doesn't produce guns, right? We talked about Haiti being uh, really an agricultural country, um, even if it's been extremely urbanized in the last two decades, but right, the guns are not being produced in Haiti, they're coming from elsewhere. So it raises the question again about what Alex brought up, right? The local oligarchs, right? The local um, capitalists, the comprador's, you know, the really the middle the middle people right I don't know if you would call them full the aspiring capitalist um, class in Haiti and you know they are involved whether we've been able to prove it or not right For, because many of the ports in Haiti are not controlled by the state and even if the state has some amount of um, oversight it's marred with some amount of corruption right we have a major port which is in the Bay of Port-au-Prince called Port Lafito which is a free trade zone it is controlled by the Bijou family, which are the richest, you know, family in Haiti. I don't know if we would call them Haitians, because you know, where is their citizenship located? We could talk about how you know the Haitian, the the oligarchs in Haiti hold multiple citizenships, um, and right that that port is essentially funded by the state. 
so the by, by the Pei Ashtika in 2015. And essentially, it's one of the only that ports, in, one of the three ports in the Caribbean that can receive the Panamax boats, which are these boats that can go to the Panama Canal, which means bringing in goods of all kinds from Asia and back and forth, right? So, you know, Haiti really, even though we tend to want to isolate it from the bigger picture, we have to place it in this larger um, uh, understanding, right, or analysis of capitalism and imperialism and, you know, U.S. Uh, attempting to stay hegemonic and these other countries who also are part of um, the landscape, right, whether we're talking about a Martinique and Guadeloupe that also recruit Haitians to work on banana plantations to export to the hexagon. So, you know, I think putting all that together and, and the circulation of guns and how it's profitable. Um, and there are many you know, theories about why the gangs have been given this much space. And even uh, under uh, Moise, who's assassinated at home, right? That they were given a lot of room to circulate in the country, right? And so many folks pegged him and the gangs together. And so he, his assassination becomes you know, very symbolic of the kind of terror that people are living on the ground. And you'll see that the gang violence really um, increased once people were really actively protesting under this banner of the where is the Tito Caribe money for three years, right? And as soon as people took to the streets and thousands and throughout different cities in October and November 2018, you had this massacre, 71 people, broad daylight, collective rape of 11 women and children in the La Saline neighborhood, right? And this is a neighborhood known for its historical militancy. So I think the, the issue of the guns, where they are coming from, is also an interesting one that I think, you know, I would love for, I'm not sure how to, with my new brand new baby, right, to engage this kind of research, but this would be another way for us to reveal what other countries, um, are involved in the destabilization of Haiti right now. Thank you. So the last question before I turn it over to folks in the room for the reflections or question is, what do we do? So we've heard about the role of private industry, South Korea, uh, farming, gun violence, guns, earthquakes, uh, the role of Brazil, Chile, uh, climate change, Spain, Colombia, all these players focusing and acting negatively mainly on Haiti. So could you leave us, Alex, Karen, and Ramira, with what recommendations you have for students, faculty, staff, civil society uh, in five minutes or less? What are your recommendations? What can we do? And then I'll turn it over to the folks in the room for any comments or reflections. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, well, look, um, Haiti cannot solve that problem by itself. Um, because, first of all, because it's not going to be left alone to do so. Um, <coughs> if there were, in my view, what there would need to be is a, is, a, is a government in Haiti that would prioritize the needs and aspirations and possibilities that exist in Haiti for the majority of nations. And that's a high trick. Because Haiti does not live in isolation from other countries. And insofar as other countries benefit from the situation in Haiti, either by keeping it as a lower supplier of the cheapest labor in the region for their own investments, insofar as also there is a demand for cheap Asian labor abroad to produce crops that they're not able to do without paying substantially more to their own workers. Haiti is going to be caught in this quandary. And we had this again with the uh, first attempt at a progressive reform in Haiti by when Aristide came to power. Aristide had spoken a correct, I mean, a, a good progressive language of what we call putting the people under the table, make them sit at the table, which is a euphemism for in fact bringing the people up to the standard of possibilities that the country would offer them by making them truly equal citizens. As I said before, 
IOC was revoked almost seven months after his first election. He spent three years in exile, was brought back to Clinton, paid his bail, full back to the United States, and said, Well, okay, we'll do what you want. And that was the end of that. IOC was the last possible or the last attempt at a progressive government coming to power in India. Now, all the others have had to pay their dues in order to just to stay in power. Uh, I think it was mentioned before with you know, the attempt of Petro Caribe when Prepao was in power. Prepao was receiving substantial subsidies from Venezuela when Chavez was in power. And what Venezuela did was to sell Haiti oil below the market price and allow the Haitian government to resell the petroleum domestically at market price, where the Haitian government could keep the proceeds of the profits made by selling by in the form of aid that Venezuela gave it, was able to now begin to plan for the possibility, Prevar was also quite a progressive figure at first, to create more education, to create more jobs, to create better standards of living and healthcare and so on for the population. Prevar didn't last very long. Since then, it has been back to business as usual. Farmer by Martelly and so on and the rest. Yes, the data that was mentioned before, and then Moise, which continued the same, the same game of countering the interests of foreign investors and the domestic Asian business class, which also insists on having access to super aid. So, what to do is something that no one here, I cannot answer, I cannot give you an answer of what needs to be done, except that. Haitian <clears throat> people are going to have to figure out on the ground how they're going to deal with this situation, but it's a tall, it's a very tall order because Haiti is not, does not exist in by itself. It exists in the context of other powers that have in fact greater sin on what happens in Haiti than what the than, than what the Haitian government itself can do. And now that the country is also beginning a decline into chaos with the gang violence that is threatening security down in Port Prince, but not in other provincial cities, and there is no police force to try to curb that. So I don't have you know, a, a movement. The Haitian people, there is a recent coalition of Haitians. Uh, active government, I mean, uh, non governmental organizations, political organizations, civic organizations, who join together despite their differences to create what is called the Montana Accord, which is an accord drawn up by the luxurious hotel in Haitian Lead in the circle of the Prince, where they are calling for what they call a national unity government to begin to reconstruct the uh, that has gone nowhere since the assassination of Moise. Uh, Moise with now you know, Henri, who is his prime minister, serving as de facto prime minister, who is, has no interest in really going to democratic elections to create a government that would begin to answer the demands and needs of the Haitian population. So this is where the impasse is, but there are forces in Haiti who are indeed thinking on how to reconstruct the society in more equal progressive terms. But the question again is not only to think about it, but to implement those possibilities. And, and so far as I can see, there is no interest on the support for both in which Brazil is a major player, and all the United States, Canada, France, and so on, to really change the situation in Haiti in favor of the that is what needs to happen. Thank you, Alex. So, Haitians in Haiti, the affected community, uh, needs to figure it out, but as Alex said, that's a tall order. So, Mamira, what is your blueprint, and do you have any recommendations for, for what academia, the private sector, and the public sector can do regarding implementing your blueprint or recommendations for improving the situation? And get ready for because I'm going to ask you the same question. 
I mean, I think like Alex is a tough question. And I think the first thing is that Haitians need to decide for themselves, right? Um, rather than having their so-called solutions imposed on them by the core group, you know, or the US, the UN. Um, and as Alex has said, there are many groups of people in Haiti who are fully capable and ready to assume, you know, that position. Of course, we have criticisms um, about that process, of course, um, some of the alternatives that are being um, proposed. But I think on the US side, I think it's supporting the work that Gelin is doing, right? Um, and I think we can go even further to think about, since we talked about climate here, very briefly, um, the impact that the US has, right, as one of the largest consumers on the planet is to think about um, how we are part of driving this system, right? We make the gaps in the Walmarts possible. And so there's a group out of New York um, called, uh, it's a coalition organizing against dictatorship in Haiti. They've called for a boycott of you know, Target, for example, that not only exploits their workers inside the shop, but also right where the clothes are coming from, whether it's in Haiti or other parts of the world, you know, thinking about uh, Asia, for example. But, you know, so I think it's really for us to ask questions of ourselves about how we're consuming um, and sort of just going along with the sort of development um, that we benefit from, the good life here in the United States. Um, and I think certainly you know, as we're starting to prepare for a new electoral cycle here um, is, you know, essentially to, to start breaking away from this really one party, you know, system even though they, they, they claim that it's a two-party one that really advocates for this capitalist system that's destroying the planet um, and to really organize into alternatives, right? So boycotting these products, like rethinking how we consume and you know, not falling for whatever the democratic party is going to feed us next. I'm saying it, yes, out loud. Um, to to have us stop right some of the movements we had seen on the streets right the rebellions of 2020 that were asking for massive defunding of the police for example right which is connected to the military industrial complex and we see Biden is you know giving billions of dollars to Ukraine but right folks who are now um, you know who are homeless houseless right have to deal with um, you know their own issues right student debt I think there are ways that we need to have more academics show the bigger picture. I think the work that, you know, Alex Dupuis and folks like that from before have done is to show, right, by showing Haiti in conversation with the larger system, it gives us an idea, right, of how we can um, affect the system on the end, you know, on our end here, on the overdeveloped end. And if we could have academics do more work, right, where even if you are highlighting a local phenomenon that you continue to put it in context in conversation with the global system and continue to unmask right this reality for folks I think that that's something academics should do right in their work is make these connections for folks and there's a lot of you know Marxist folks who do that kind of work and not everybody you know is a Marxist but I, I would encourage folks to to do a little more of that kind of work academically in their in their research, um, I think that that would be a, a kind of specific academic um, call that I would make. Thank you. So last word, Gary. So we heard uh, patients in Haiti need to decide for themselves, and on our end, academics could do more research, but reveal and push it um, and unmask it so that it doesn't stay on some shelf. Um, and that the U.S. should support NGOs like yours. What are your thoughts? I do not have a blueprint. I don't think it's even possible. But um, what what I believe is that uh, create sustainability in Haiti will be a first step to to providing and allowing uh, Haiti to decide for themselves, making sure that. We create systems that will uplift and promote schools in Haiti that are sustainable, create hospitals that people don't have to flee if they have a car, they are able to get the proper medical care, create a revive the agriculture, 
uh, to make sure that people in the Aliya country, people in the villages are not forced to flee because they are unable to provide for themselves. Really, sustainability will be key to Haiti moving forward in the, in the next step and really uh, um, get us to a pathway where Haiti can stay home and not be forced to leave and, 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 and be displaced in the villages and then in, in, in the countryside. But also we have to understand that uh, um, anti-Black racism and white supremacy as it relates to a colonialism uh, is still in full effect when it comes to Haiti, understanding that the system is working exactly the way it's supposed to be. If you were to look at the, uh, 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 a blue point of what the idea that I mentioned from the beginning of Haiti and the fact that it is and was and will continue to be unacceptable to the West, the very existence of Haiti, then we will understand uh, why Haiti is what needs to be, why the destabilization of Haiti why the lack of, of sustainable infrastructure in Haiti? Why, if you really want to ensure the prosperity of Haiti, the prosperity of, of, of people who have fought to gain independence and making sure that uh, 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 we don't continue the brand, the, the dream power brand that uh, both myself and uh, Professor Judy mentioned is really looking at how colonialism, the remnants of that, and how white supremacy and anti-black racism is at the root of what we are seeing happening in the country. So for me, I'm thinking a sustainable uh, uh, um, um, infrastructure in Haiti to help us to alleviate the poverty, the, the, the gang violence, and all of those things who are pushing people in that way. Uh, I don't think there is a specific blueprint, but I think those will be steps forward to to uh, alleviate what we are seeing in the ground right now. Thank you. And Mamira mentioned that not only do Haitians in Haiti need to uh, come up with their own solutions, and as you suggested, improvement of the health sector, the agricultural sector, but for those outside of the U.S., as she said, we need to support organizations like yours. So I'm hoping that Haitian Bridge Alliance which is your organization, has a donate now button, um, and then we can help you in your sustainability to make sure that you keep doing the great work that you're doing. So in the few minutes that we have left, um, welcome those of you in the room or in the Zoom room to uh, share your reflections, comments, or questions, and if you could tell us uh, your name. Good afternoon, my name is Evelyn Nordro. I'm a historian of the African diaspora, and I teach in Santa Barbara, California. Um, thank you so much for this time. And um, my, I only have an observation. When we say that Haiti does not live in isolation because of all this interconnectedness with the Caribbean and the world, we think about Korean flying from Guatemala and discovering something. I think that actually, in some ways, Haiti remains isolated. Um, in spite of all this connection that it has. And so the way I look at it is that we, we're dealing with two different fronts. There is the reality of the multinationals who all want to target and all the devices <coughs> that you mentioned that are going to try to set up more and more factories paying this, this minimum, minimum below wage, uh, which was imposed. But then there is also the civil society all over the world. To this day, people don't know much about Haiti. Haiti still remains this, this obscure little place that no one knows nothing about. I've taught courses about the Haitian Revolution to seniors who are majoring in history, and it's not until they take my course, they're like, how come I do not know? Not even knowing about the meaning, the philosophical content, of what Haiti was proposing then, but why all this plotting has been done and, and continues to be done against Haiti. In Spanish-speaking Latin America, in TV, 
And even in the US, when people talk about something going bad, oh, it's like Haiti. Because Haiti is portrayed as the complete failure, and people don't understand where or how this failure has come to be. One thing that I personally think is crucial in this process, and it's not a short process, it's a long term process, is to actually, and this goes back to what you were saying about white supremacy and race issues, is to make sure that we train teachers, elementary school teachers, high school teachers, in teaching and understanding and teaching the role of Haiti and how Haiti is being demonized. And in that context, I was surprised to hear that in the core group, Spain is part of that. Colonial Spain was crucial in isolating Haiti, in bad mountain Haiti, in actually profiting the fact that San Domain was destroyed to create the sugar industry in Cuba until today. Spain was the one who completely wanted to silence and to make almost a vow of not to even mention Haiti when Haiti created. And then at this point, I'm beginning to question, that's going to be my spine, perhaps my next research, whether Spain never forgave Haiti for supporting Simon Bolivar, because Spain lost significant uh, parts in the Americas way back then. And we think about that as a very long, long, long past. And just when you were talking about, I remember that in the year 2004, there were some bombing of some stations in Spain. Those who bombed the station actually claimed they did so to avenge the fact that Spaniards and monarchy had expelled this land from Spain in the 1500s. So history, yes, things change and shift and go back and forth. But at times we need to also understand of the continuities and the sequel of that pattern to the present. So to me, a, a part would be through education to disisolate, to integrate Haiti as a part of a continuum of a philosophical alternative to the status quo that was full blown exploding in 1804. Okay. Oh. Hi, everybody. My name is Julia Carletti. I'm the director of the Latin American and Latin American Studies uh, Center. Um, and uh, I want to thank all the panelists for excellent presentations, as well as Fernando for his moderation. Um, one of the articles, uh, news articles, that prompted um, the the idea of, of convening this panel had to do with the trekking that Asian migrants are doing from South America to the US border, going through the Darien Gap. Um, that, you know, um, New York Times article published in the fall of last year was really um, hard to read. Um, and, and more than any other piece of news, at least to me, depicted the humanitarian crisis that we were dealing with. Um, my question is for any of the of the presenters. Um, it, it's, it was very interesting to hear Mamira talking about the, the the push that the 2004 intervention <coughs> of the and Chile created in 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 Haiti, um, and at the time. Brazil was ruled by the Workers' Party, by you know a, a, a socialist, we could say, party that was close to Maduro, uh, or, or sorry, Chavez before, who you know facilitated economic policies in Haiti. So it's it's an interesting contrast, right? That's something that I just want to uh, mention in passing. But my question is. Um, what were the reasons, or why was it that those thousands, you know, dozens or hundreds of thousands of, of Haitians that migrated first to Brazil or Chile were forced, perhaps, or I don't know if there was choice, but but it started to walk north. This is, you know, a trek that that I'm sure no one takes lightly, 
So could you talk a little bit about what conditions in those two countries have led these people to embark on these extremely dangerous um, uh, journey? Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you so much uh, for that question. I will pass it to our uh, professors to read and um, to also uh, share. But I can share with you what we have learned from the people who made the trek themselves. Uh, in 2015, I received the first call stating that they had black migrants at the US Mexico border. And I could not believe it. I just went out of curiosity to see what was happening. That day, I met the 12 young men and women, 10 young men, two young women, and I was asking them, How did you get here? And they explained to me that we walked from Brazil to the US-Mexico border. And I asked them to repeat for me what you just said. Did you fly into Mexico? They said, no, we walked. And of course, the entire South and Central America crossing 10, 11 countries by foot to get to the US-Mexico border. And so my next question was, why would you do something like that? And they started explaining to me that they were all survivors of the earthquake. They have lost mothers, fathers, brothers, everything. And they were part of the program that they went to Brazil to provide migrant labor to help build for what was going to be the World Cup Duel Olympics. Unfortunately, turmoil in Brazil, the economy, the economy collapsed, the political turmoil, forced them to once again have to migrate from Brazil in search of life, literally Shechilavi. So those people explaining to me after the survivor earthquake went to Brazil, they were forced to leave Brazil to make their way to the United States. That was in 2015. And so they were sharing how um, even in Brazil, they have kind of racism, uh, the fact that they, they were being looked at uh, one of the reasons why they were starting to have uh, economic issues in Brazil as well, the lack of opportunities. People were literally uh, um, attacking them in the streets. And, and um, uh, employers would be stealing their wages, not paying them their wages. And they would be refused to hire them because they were no longer needed. So they create a subclass of, of non-citizens needing to survive, therefore they fled once again making the journey. They literally walked between five to seven months to make it. And a lot of people unfortunately died in the Darien uh, Gap, which is uncharted territory forcing people to make that journey. And I cannot even begin to tell you how many stories we have heard and uh, what we saw in the video is a result of people continue to Shechilavi. And the people we met who started coming from Chile was in 2018, end of 2018, beginning 2019. In 2015, 2016, up to that time, were only people from Brazil. And in 2018, we started seeing people coming from Chile, and their main reason is also anti-black racism in Chile, where even pregnant women are unable to, to, to give birth in proper hospital, being turned away, and in all of those extreme prejudice against Asian <coughs> that are forcing people to leave Chile, making the journey uh, to the US-Mexico border. So, but these are directly from people who have left those, those spaces due to what they have explained. I did not believe in reality. We are doing research along the way. We have four reports that, that have come out to explain the reality, specifically looking at black women migrating through the journey. And we are currently working on what happened with the Berlin Gap to make sure that we highlight and elevate the realities of black migrants, not only from Haiti, but also from different African countries and the LGBTQAI members from, uh, from, from uh, Jamaica. So as part of the work that the Haitian Red Alliance is doing, is one created the first black immigrant bell fund, because when, my, when asylum seekers, refugees, migrants come to the US-Mexico border, when they ask for asylum, 
eighth president of the time, they will be put in immigration prison. And, and one of the conditions for them to be released will have to pay the government a, a bond in order for them to be released. But when we were looking at black immigrants specifically from Haiti and Africa, we saw the, the amount of bond for those people were anywhere between ten to fifty, seventy thousand dollars comparing to other migrants. And in addition to that, we also started to see a large number of people from Cameroon fleeing five on conflict in Cameroon coming to the US Mexico border. They made the same journey from, uh, from uh, uh, Cameroon to Ecuador. From Ecuador, they go to Brazil thinking it will be better. From Brazil, they met with the Haitians and how they were uh, 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 impacting newly arrived migrants. They made the journey to the United States. So with that, we also created the first uh, Cameroonian advocacy network, and I am very pleased to say uh, last Friday, we won a long for battle, uh, and won, we won CPS for over 40,000 Cameroonians who are currently here in the U.S. So really looking into why people are leaving their hometown to go to those countries and then being forced again to leave based on their lived experience. I think to add to that, you're absolutely right. It's, it's not only Asians who have experienced this, but large numbers of Africans also. In fact, many of those across the border from Mexico into Texas along with the Asians. And so the track that you know, the really interesting to stop line is exactly that. Yeah, so it's Central Africa, especially West Africa, Central Africa, who are also coming to, to the West, specifically to the US and other parts of the Caribbean and South America. Where they're hoping to be able to find some kind of labor. Uh, but the, the racism that they encounter there is, is also what's driving anti immigrant sentiments in those countries. So, Zumira, do you have anything else to add? And we'll close it up. Um, I, I mean, I just wanted to say right, the, this, the racial capitalist logic that's operated in the Americas over the past 500 years, right, with Black bodies in general having been reduced to flesh and since the end of African-based slavery in the 19th century and the U.S. recolonization of the Caribbean in the early 20th century, Haitians have been forced at the bottom of the labor pool, right? They're circulating on plantations at home and other U.S. holdings or colonies. 21st century, this logic persists even among so-called progressive governments of the global South, right? I don't remember who it was. I can't see the crowd, right? Mentioned Brazil and Chile. And you'll see that it's under the progressive governments of Lula and Bachelet, right in Chile, that you're going to have the Minusta, right, the UN occupation, come to be, and the recruitment of Haitians to do, you know, these so-called service construction projects. And some folks who've been doing research on, you know, in Brazil and Chile have talked about how there were very right, favorable, quote unquote, um, specific immigration laws that favored Haitians who were coming out of the earthquake to Brazil. And of course, as you're switching over to a right-wing government, and we've seen, right, the xenophobia, a general anti-immigrant um, uh, sentiment of, of, you know, our Trump counterpart there in Brazil, right, that Haitians <coughs> suffered. And then you see the same thing in Chile, where you had the progressive government at first and then gets replaced by Piñera, who ends up targeting Haitians specifically to write you know, immigration laws. And so you have these laws around immigration, you know, being somewhat favorable um, for Haitian migration under these so-called leftist governments, right? Um, and then that's being reversed when you have the right wing kicking over. But you know, again, the, the sort of white supremacist racial capitalist logic isn't doesn't escape right countries like Brazil and Chile, even when they're led by leftists. And, I, and I'll just say this, I remember being on a panel with an Afro-Brazilian activist who said, you know, on the panel and after he said, you know, we the Afro-Brazilians, we said no to Lula, right, when they were planning to go occupy Haiti. And we said that this is an occupation and this is an infringement upon Haitian sovereignty and we Black, you know, Brazilians stand against it, right? So I don't think that Lula, um, or Bachelet, you know, were exempt from wanting to right, ascend to a certain amount of, um, you know, visible power in the region. 
and they were they're they're not exempt from applying the same logic really and especially when it comes to Haitian and other black migrants so that that would be my my last comment and hi Ian by the way <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're going we're gonna to come back at four uh, after a quick break to hear our keynote speaker, but let's thank our, our guest panelists for making it all work. and the reason the immigrants are friendly to, to explicate the root causes of the resettlement abroad remain uncertain and ambiguous. According to Massey et al., quote, a, a variety of theoretical models have been proposed to explain why international migration begins. And although each ultimately seeks to explain the same thing, they employ radically different concepts, assumptions, and frames of reference, unquote. Therefore, they no longer suffice to provide a full and exhaustive understanding of that age-old phenomenon and life-altering experience. For this presentation, we will use Wallerstein's well-system analytical approach which presents the global economic system of comprising of core, semi-peripheral, and peripheral socio-political entities to provide a more accurate and efficient understanding of Haitian migrations through the Americas and beyond. Initially, beginning in the 1960s, eminent pioneer scholars such as Terence Hopkins, Samir Amin, Andre Gunter Frank, Alejandro Cortes, John Walton, and Giovanni Aridi analyze the root causes of the complexity of the development of underdevelopment by focusing their investigation on Latin America and Africa and their relationships with many global capitalist entities. They concluded that these relationships in addition to impoverished, these countries generated sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly, selective recruitment endeavors like the US Brazil program 
that encourage cheap and compliant labor movement from the former colonies or dependent territories towards the dominant centers of the North. In the 1970s, Emmanuel Wallerstein extended the reach of this method methodological approach by arguing that instead of considering the North and the South as comprised of separate and disconnected national units, units, it would make better sense for scholars to consider them as part of the whole and integrated global system within which uneven power relations exist. According to the world system theory, as global capitalism evolved from the 15th century onward, it produced a system of lopsided and asymmetrical relationships that connected the economies of the core, semi-periphery and periphery, the best way for the core countries and the international financial institution they created to exploit the natural and human resources of the dependent societies. To achieve their goals, the elite of the core made alliances of convenience with the elites of the semi-peripheral and peripheral elites and the military who then served as the other enablers. As that two-sided relationship continued to persist in the global economic system, the development of the semi-periphery and periphery is quote hampered by the subordinate and dependent status. And of course, these relationships have produced exploitative hegemonic and most importantly, hierarchical relationships that have developed among the integrated dominant and dominated political entities within the global system. In the end, this system functions as a network of multiplex asymmetric relationships and substantive inequalities in wealth and power among the different strata. As these global forces penetrate deep into the economies of the semi-periphery and periphery, they produce significant modifications in these societies. For example, that incursion displaces significant sectors of the semi-peripheral and peripheral labor force, creating high unemployment and under, unemplo underemployment in these societies. Subsequently, crying social inequalities ensue in these, in these dependent economies when the local elites and the military allies operate as the implementers of the core policies in their own countries and as the sustainers of the exploitative system that ensues, that ensues because they benefit from these policies and the ensuing abuses. The race to the bottom and the multiple coup d'etat that punctuate life into societies exemplify this dy dynamism. Concurrently, as the social condition worsen, members of the peasantry and the working class have no alternative but to migrate. However, the places to which they migrate and the modalities of migration are dictated by self-perpetuating, interlocking, and mutually reinforced processes of social capital formation, human displacement, and market consolidation that are not under the prospective migrant's control. Therefore, we argue that even though it may seem voluntary, migration is not an entirely personal decision and initiative. When it comes to Haitian migration through the Americas and beyond, many academics, lay people, and the immigrants themselves explain this phenomenon by finding the root causes of this massive population movement in the countries that are deteriorating and worsening social, economic, and political situation. Routinely, they present Haiti as not only the poorest country of the Americas, but also as one of the poorest in the world. And if poverty, political oppression, and crying social inequality are so pervasive and enduring in the country, they, they surmise that it is understandable that the pushful and neoclassical theories of migration argue that Haitians would seek better 
financial opportunities and pers personal protection abroad. Yet, Haiti has always been a poor, unstable, and violent country. However, between 1804, when it acceded to its independence, and 1915, when U.S. President Woodrow Wilson sent the Marines to occupy it, Haiti, even the most destitute among them, did not migrate in exceptionally not large numbers, not internally, not internationally. During that tumultuous period, most Haitians grew up and died in the communities where they were born. Instead, during that epoch, Haiti was a country that received immigrants from the U.S. first, when many African Americans sought refuge there to escape, to escape from racism, Jim Crow, and disenfranchisement. Next came the Germans and the French for economic and financial reasons during the 19th century. Finally, at the beginning of the 20th century, Haiti received Middle Eastern Christian Arab migrants via Marseille in the south of France as they were fleeing persecution from Turkish occupants. To fully explicate the real causes and motivations of the Asian out migration through the Americas and beyond, we will divide this presentation into four main migratory periods. During the first period, we will analyze labor induced Haitian migration during the US occupation of the country to Cuba and the Dominican Republic. The referral economy is controlled by US capitalist outposts. During the second period, we will study Haitian migration to Africa. During the third period, we will study the impact of the 1965 U.S. Hard Seller Immigration Act and its impact on Haitian migration to the United States. Finally, we will analyze induced labor migration to Brazil and Chile initially and to other contiguous South American countries subsequently. And this migration occurred after the 2010 earthquake that destroyed part of Grand Port of Grand and the surrounding region. We will show that during these periods, poverty, endemic, corrupt, and impunity, corruption and impunity and political oppression did not specifically instigate Haitian mass migration. For as Zoldberg, Sir, and Aguayo have shown, the idea that extreme poverty produces refugees and migrants is inconsistent with the fact that situations of it during economic deprivation usually have not resulted in mass in masses of persons claiming international refugee status. Instead, we will argue that foreign interests in collaboration with the Haitian financial, military, and political allies as their enablers played an, an especially significant role in promoting Haitian migration. The first wave migration to the periphery. The first mass Haitian migration period occurred during the U.S. occupation of the country, 1915-1934. During the early years of the occupation, American investors began to consider the possibility of establishing large agricultural estates in the country the same way they had done in Cuba and the Dominican Republic. To that effect, the occupation financial advisor, Arthur C. Millsport, declared that, quote, individualistic sport farming includes the use of capital, of irrigation, of skill management, and of efficient marketing, and they had to go. Agreeing with him, the High Commissioner in charge of the occupation, John Russell, advocated abolishing the Haitian system, whereby each peasant owned and formed its little plot of land in favor of establishing large plantations controlled by foreigners. This, however, Schmidt argued in his book, The United States Occupation of Haiti, involved, quote, involved the unpleasant likelihood that Haitian peasant freeholders would be reduced to peonage. However, they face a big hindrance to their aspirations 
because the, between 1804 and 1915, all the Haitian constitutions forbade whites to own real estate in Haiti. To remove that impediment, in 1918, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the then under secretary of the US Navy and future US president, disdainfully claimed that he personally wrote a new constitution for the country which eliminated the vent and opened the door for US capitalist exploitation of the country. When the Haitian legislatures refused to adopt the new constitution and decided to write an entire American one, the Marines dis dismissed the legislative body, locked the parliament's building door, building's door, which remained closed until 1929, or over 11 years and placed heavy armed soldiers there to prevent the legislature from returning to the forum to deliberate on the proposed new constitution and other state matters. After that, using the threat of the baronet, the Marines organized a plebiscite to legalize the new constitution. They chose to write it in French, although at that time, the level of literacy was extremely low. Heavy armed Marines oversaw the dissolution of the ballots, all of which supported the new constitution. Although the, the voters could obtain opposition ballots, they were not readily available. They had to request them from the Marines. However, because of intimidation and other deterrents, few of them asked for it. For them. As a result, out of a population of around 1.9 million people, the proposed new constitution won by a landslide of 98,225 to 768. The vote for the new constitution took place only in the major urban areas. It completely bypassed the rural communities. The new document's main target and the place most of the population lived at that time. After that victory, the American occupiers reformed the Haitian courts, replacing the judges, the judges who were hostile to American business interests in Haiti with client and psychopathic ones. Soon after the new constitution had been effective, the U.S. Department sent investigators to study the possibility Haiti offered for the establishment of large agricultural exploitations by American investors to change the country's agricultural landscape. The 1924 United States Department of Commerce pamphlet entitled, quote, Haiti and an Economic Survey noted that, quote, possibilities for agricultural development were limited, limited by a chaotic system of small-scale agriculture and water sovereignty which made, made it difficult for investors to obtain clear title to large tracts of land, unquote. It did not take long for U.S. investors to rush to Haiti to establish large plantations for exploitation. For example, Tropical Banana, a subdivision of the Atlantic Fruit Company for the cultivation of banana for export, became interested in Haiti. Also, the Americans became interested in the production of sugar in Haiti to complement the investment in the Dominican Republic and Cuba and created the Haitian American Sugar Company, which was registered in Wilmington, Delaware, and not in Port au Prince. And that company absorbed itself of all responsibilities for its workers by subhiring through native gang bosses. In 1939, after the occupation uh, ended, the Goodwich Company selected Haiti as the only country in the Caribbean suitable for the plantation and harvesting of rubber trees to produce natural rubber. Subsequently, in 1941, as the United States supply of natural rubber was hampered by the global conflict, Shada. Société Haitienne Américaine de Développement Agricole received 50 years lease on 150,000 
acres of peasant land, along with a 50-year mon monopoly on the export of all natural rubber producing meat. In addition, according to labor, the American obtained the, mon the monopoly of the planting of oil crops, drug plants, spices, fiber plants, or sisal. The simulation of Indian crop industries and the development of forestry resources peculiar to the tropics. To finance their adventures in Haiti, the first National City Bank of New York took control of Haiti's National Bank from France, becoming the country's chief treasurer. Yet, City Bank paid the Haitian government no interest for its, de for its deposits in the bank. And when it did, the interest were less than what it could have obtained from other banks. To cripple the country, the country financially, on December 7, 17, 1914, before the occupation, the United States Marine entered Haiti belligerently and took custody of Haiti's gold reserve of around $500,000. They took it to New York, to Wall Street, and they deposited it in the coffers of the City Bank of New York, where it remained confiscated for five years. The Americans would great benefit from their investment in Haiti. For example, the Daily Financial American of New York declared that after the Americans, the Americans had manipulated the vote for the new constitution and corrupted the courts, Haiti presented a marvelous opportunity to American investors because the Haitians were very gifted, easy, easily controlled, and did a decent job for 20 cents for a 12-hour work day. While in Panama, for example, the Americans were paying their workers $3 per day for the same job. When some Haitian activists advocated on behalf of their workers, U.S. financial advisor Sidney de la Rue opposed passing a law to raise wages in 1930, arguing that, quote, the greatest asset that he has is cheap labor. However, there was another hurdle the Americans needed to overcome to secure the land necessary for the larger economy. Although the Haitian state was the major landholder, Haitian peasants had occupied them as quarters since independence. Luckily for the Americans, and unfortunately for the Haitian peasants, to fend off land speculators and land grabbers, the peasant had refused to, to register the land, the land holding in the state, thinking that occupation meant ownership. As a result, on June 6, 1924, the Haitian legislature, under pressure from the Marines, voted to extend to the Americans the power to verify the legal possessions of all peasant lands in Haiti. This mandate resulted in the expulsion of thousands of peasants who could not prove legally they owned the land they had occupied for generations. According to Judge Sejourné, a custom and pest inspector, in the North only, the Americans expelled 50,000 peasants from their domains. Few of them received compens compensation from the Haitian government or the American occupiers and investors. Those who did received a paltry sum for them. Having lost their land, unable to, unable to pay their debts, and incapable of feeding their families, the disposal station became despondent. A considerable, a considerable number of them joined the ranks of the, Caco, the Cacos, a paramilitary group that was leading an implacable and relentless, relentless real welfare against the forces of the occupation. At the same time, representatives of the US, U.S. sugar estates that were established in Cuba and the Dominican Republic sent recruiters to Haiti to harvest this idle and desperate labor force. As a result, by 1929, the U.S. owned sugar conglomerates had brought over 300,000 Haitian peasants and lower class urban workers to Cuba. 
my maternal grandparents were two of them. They recruited more workers who went to the Dominican Republic to join the American home sugar plantations there. According to Susie Costo, a Haitian historian, the American officials encouraged that black trade when they transformed themselves into recruiting agents. The way they saw it, that mass migration would, would resolve the democratic explosion in Haiti. It also worked as a safety valve for the agrarian crisis engendered by the Haitian peasant dispossessions. The population depletion was so dire that on October 2, 1927, a Haitian newspaper, Le Temps, wrote that, quote, the South Department was the shadow of what it was 10 or 15 years ago. This department lost 80,000 people to Cuba without, without counting the women who migrated there as prostitutes, unquote. These recruited individuals were more like modern slaves than immigrants. Although they made $1 to $1.50 per day, much more than they could have earned in Haiti, they were in worse condition in Cuba and in the Dominican Republic they had done they had been in Haiti before my break. For example, the Haitian pink cutters could not leave the plantations. They were separated from mainstream Cuban and Dominican societies. But to buy all the necessities, they had to buy all the necessities from company stores that did not hesitate to please them. Also, although this country's constitution recognized the, the use solely legal concept, they denied the Haitian progenies of the right to acquire Cuban and Dominican citizenships. The living conditions of the Haitian workers that the Haitian workers experienced in Cuba and the Dominican Republic were so harsh and inhuman that the U.S. Council in Cape Haitian Mr. Winthrop wrote that upon the return to Haiti, many of them have forgotten their ages and some even their names. What is remarkable to note is that the Haitian consuls in Cuba and the Dominican Republic did nothing to protect these Haitian workers. Indeed, they, benef they benefited from that human trade by charging the important Haitian labor exorbitant fees for passports, taxes, registration cards, IDs, etc. For example, when in November 1933, the Cuban government proceeded to expel 995 Haitian cane cutters from the Oriente province in Cuba, the Haitian Council in the province raised no obligation to the surprise of the Cuban government. However, Sean Wick, the U.S. Consul at the U.S. Embassy in Santiago, reported that the reason for his silence that he had pilfered $1,900 granted to him by the Cuban government to cover the cost incurred by the, by the expelled Haitians. Beginning in 1931, along by the number of Haitians and Jamaicans living in Cuba, the Cuban government, fearing the Negroization, but most especially the Haitianization of the Cuban population, halted Cuban immigration to the island, deported significant numbers of workers to the homelands. By the second half of the 1930s, Cuba forcefully deported almost 40,000 Haitians back to Haiti per year creating a forced return migration of importance. However, the U.S. owned sugar factories' needs for cheap labor mitigated that initiative. The Haitian government, notorious for its lack of interest in the affairs of these migrants, sensing the dire predicament of the Cuban sugar factories, unexpectedly provided the Haitian workers with diplomatic representation and suspended immigration to Cuba temporarily. Haiti's foreign minister denounced the local Cuban officials for mistreating the deportees by preventing, them, by preventing them from gathering their belongings and failing to inform them of their destination. In turn, the Cuban sugar company protested the mass deportation 
because you rely on the Haitian king cutters for the, for the harvest. They appealed to the U.S. State Department to intervene on their behalf. After the U.S. State Department had forcefully communicated their grievances to Haitian officials, the Haitian government quickly rescinded the moratorium on immigration. After the occupation had ended in 1934, migration to Cuba had been considerable. During the occupation, the Marines trained for police for the police force named La Gendarmerie Haitienne, the Haitian Gendarmerie, as the appointment in Haiti. Trained in all the exactions and strongman tactics of the Marine, they became the oppressors of the population and the political kingmakers in Haitian politics, overthrowing presidents whenever they received orders from Washington via the U.S. Embassy in Port au Prince. To train the subsequent generations of military personnel, the U.S. regularly sent training, training missions to Haiti and or sponsored members of the Haitian military who went to Panama to receive their training at the School of the Americas. After Panama had expelled them from its territory on September 21, 1984, the U.S. relocated the, the, the training facilities at Fort Benning, Georgia, under the name of Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation, or WINSEC. The exactions of the Haitian army have been so egregious and horrendous that through you, the eminent Haitian anthropologist stated that it caused the separation of the state from the nation. In the meantime, fearing the same phenomenon of Negroization and Haitianization in this country, between October 2 and 8, 1937, Trujillo, the Dominican dictator, conducted a massacre of more than 20,000 Haitian migrants and Dominican Haitians living in his country. Because the Dominican soldiers carried the massacre using the bayonet, the bayonet, machetes, knives, and not guns to avoid awakening the suspicion of the targeted victims, the carnage was known as El Corte or the Cutter. Otherwise, Stenio Benson, the Haitian president, and Trujillo's enabler forbade any media discussion of the event in Haiti because he was financially indebted to the Dominican dictator. Between 1937 and 1950, Haitian migration died down considerably. However, soon after he accepted to the presidency in 1957, Duvalier began taking advantage of the country's excess labor force and its proximity to the Dominican Republic to export Haitian workers there. Duvalier contacted Trujillo, the Dominican dictator, to renew the Haitian human trade that have flourished with Cuba. As part for his sympathy towards the Dominican dictator, Duvalier received a kickback of $8 per migrant his government recruited and sent to the Dominican Republic. That scheme netted the two dictators millions of dollars on the back of Haitian peasants and poor Haitian workers. In 1958, Duvalier took a $4 million loan from the Cuban government and he used as collateral for the loan the deposit of the Haitian corn cutters in the Dominican Republic who had kept half of the salaries in the in his central bank to, as a security measure to ensure that they would return after the harvest to their country. Batista received a million dollar kickback from Duvalier. Duvalier had no intention of paying back the loan because he wanted the Haitian worker to lose the, the, the holdings in the, in the Cuban banks. Auspiciously for him, after Castro had, had overthrown Batista on January 1st, 1959, and moved Cuba to the socialist bloc thereafter, relations between the two countries ended. As a result, Duvalier never paid that loan. That theft of the Haitian immigrant saving impoverished them further and made them prone to migrating once more. The second way, Haitian migration to Africa. In, early, in the early 1960s, through the organization 
the Nations in your Congo, ONU, the United Nations began to raid Haiti small cultures of professionals to replace the European administrators of African bureaucracies that have left the former colonies in the heels of the decolonization impetus. During the same period, as the Duvalier dictatorship began to affirm its grip over the country, with the avail of Washington that feared the spread of communism in the region, through the domino effect, a substantial number of Haitians participated in the UN programs in Benin and Cameroon, as well as in the two Congos. For his part, Duvalier who feared that the remaining small professionals would destabilize his regime if they stayed in the country, worked with the United Nations and the UNESCO to hire more hundreds of Haitians to serve as professional and te technical experts in newly independent African nations such as Benin, Cameroon, Ghana, and Nigeria. After the Duvalier had self-selected self -selected himself as president for life in 1964, more American technicians and professionals found employment with the United Nations and left Haiti to, to Duvalier's and the Americans delight because they were suspected of being leftist and communist sympathizers in Haiti. To neutralize the rest, Duvalier expelled them from the country, imprisoned and killed many more. And as of the cumulative causation theory of migration or chain migration of certain the migration of these professionals gave impetus to the migration fever that gripped the population. The third way, Asian migration to the U.S. To the U.S. In 1965, the U.S. Congress passed the Hot Seller Immigration Act for the first time in American history, which made it possible for non-white immigrants to enter the country in large numbers. As the dictatorship continued to terrorize the population with Washington's avail assistance and support, Haiti used all means to leave Haiti. At the same time, as the U.S. Embassy in Port-au-Prince recruited a substantial number of blue-collar workers to migrate to the U.S. as permanent residents, such as seamstresses, tailors, cabinet makers, shoemakers, and mechanics, to replace those American workers who shunned that type of employment or were fighting in Vietnam, the urge to migrate grew exponentially in Haiti. And as those migrants sponsored the relative to join them in America, the migration fever caught the Haitian population. Those who could not get visas resolved to travel to America in flimsy, in flimsy uh, rickety boats to escape the inferno Haiti had become with Washington assistance and help. Known as the boat people, these migrants risked their lives on the high seas in ramshackle and cherry built boats to escape from the Duvalier regime, which Washington continued to prop up against the will of the Haitian population. In 1986, when President Reagan signed Erka, Immigration Reform and Control Act, regularizing the immigrant status, immigration status of millions of undocumented immigrants, they proceeded to sponsor their relatives to join them in the United States. By the end of the 1980s, Haiti had become an immigrant and remittance country. The same year, the U.S. Congress passed Erka, the Haitian population overthrew Jean-Claude Duvalier who in 1971, after his father's death, death had become president for life with Washington avail and approval. By the time, by that time, the fear of communism, the fear that communism would spread from Cuba to the other islands had become improbable. As a result, Washington, which anticipated the demise of the USSR, unofficially withdrew its support from the regime. When the regime fell, substantial numbers of Haitians returned home to participate in the reconstruction and democratization of the country. However, it was a dream deferred. They soon realized that Duvalier had left, but he had left behind the infernal machine of Duvalierism. 
more, more distressful for the resulting, for the returning migrants and the sedentary, sedentary population was that Washington had allowed Duvalier to choose his, his successor, General Henri Nanfi, the loyal supporter of the regime. As a result, the return migrations, the return migrants rushed back to the United States. Again, when John Bertrand Aristide won the presidency on the landslide election in 1990, they hoped once more to achieve their dream and many return once more to hit. Right? So again, thank you. As you have heard, the Americans and the Haitian military and the Haitian elite gave Aristide the coup d'etat and they sent him to live in exile. And of course, after the overthrow of the first uh, Aristide regime, the FAP, a paramilitary organization, killed many Haitians who had no alternative to leave Haiti and come to the United States. And when uh, President Clinton decided to send Aristide back to Haiti, as a quid pro quo, as it was said by the panel before, Haiti, uh, Aris, uh, Lincoln, uh, Clinton demanded that Aristide lower the tariff on the importation of rice in Haiti. And of course, that destroyed the rice, the rice industry in Haiti, putting many farmers out of, out of business, forcing them to come to the United States. And of course, he had a mea culpa after the 2000 earthquake that destroyed Port au Prince to say that I caused the problem of hunger in Haiti because of what I did and what I forced Aristide. And of course, the last, the last uh, wave the, after the 2000 earthquake that displaced a million Haitians and killed over 300,000 of them, we had Brazil and Chile. The president of Brazil and Chile went to Haiti to encourage Haitians to migrate to Brazil and to Chile, as the panel before me had spoken about, creating another mass migration to the to South America. And after the Brazilian economy tanked, there were no jobs after the the, the World Cup, and of course the the Olympics had taken place, then it became a problem for these migrants and they had to leave. And of course, the same thing happened in Chile when a when conservative regime took power in Chile. That was very hostile to immigrants, especially black immigrants, and these people were forced to leave. And of course, I want to say a few, uh, one last thing about the earthquake. After the earthquake, the ambassador in Haiti, the U.S. ambassador in Haiti, sent a cable to the U.S. department and he made the following forewarning statement in bold capital letters, the bold word is on. And he was right. And for example, Louis Luke, a 20-year American veteran of USAID and Washington, uh, United Relief and Response Coordinator who was in charge of the reconstruction of Haiti at that time, quit his job with USAID, sensing that he could become a millionaire by benefiting from the disaster that, he, that Haiti had observed. Look was hired by Ashbridge, an American corporation that specialized in post traumatic uh, uh, disasters around the world, paid him $30,000 a month. And that corporation never even built one house for the displaced people. Not only that, not being satisfied with the money he made on the back of the people who had gone through a disaster, he sued us with and the GB Group, a conglomerate run by one Haiti's billionaire. You didn't hear me wrong. I mean billionaire with a B. 
Gilbert Vigio, which the panel mentioned before, and he sued them for 500,000 more dollars. So when we look at these situations, when we have a close analysis of the migratory flows of nations that have settled in American countries and beyond, we see that it is not poverty per se. It is not political oppression per se. It is not on none of these things that are creating nation migration out of the country. It is the politics of the poor economies in Haiti that have turned Haiti, as I said in one of my books, into an apparent state. Haiti is not in charge of its destiny. The Haitian government is a mere puppet of the European powers, the United States and Canada. The decisions are not taken in Haiti. They are taken in these capitalist societies, in these four countries. So when we analyze these situations, we understand clear, clearly that Haiti, as Professor uh, uh, has said that Haiti lives on the fringes of the capitalist system. Professor Patton has so eloquently presented. Haiti lives on the fringes of the capitalist system. Haiti is not in charge of its destiny. So what is to be done? And the question was asked. We need to realize that as intellectuals, as thinkers, and as citizens of these four countries, we need to propagate the true reality of it to the world for them to know what is going on in Haiti, what is causing this mass migration, what is causing the instability that we have in Haiti. It is not the fault of the nations. But what I say, and I'm leaving you with this warning, Haiti created 1804. It can do it again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Burrow. Um, you know, that last statement you made, I think we could all rest with that for a very long time um, because it certainly um, is a part of why we're actually all here. So as you were talking, I was thinking to myself, I hope everyone realized how they've been taken to school right now, right? In the US, there's a phrase called, you're being schooled, and in Creole, that might be like, I don't know, <laughs> but um, but right now we've just certainly been schooled and watching, listening to you and looking at the map on the front of this cover, um, I was just thinking how dynamic this mapping that you did for us really is. Um, I do want to go back to your, you know, primary, what you're arguing around decentering the narrative of poverty around Haiti to understand the global economic and historical systems that are impacting the nation and the region. And just for those who are here in Philadelphia, I'm a historian. One of the things that I always think about as, as one of those epochs, you know, maybe pre-US occupation is even thinking about Philadelphia. If you're a Philadelphian, you know Gerard Street. Right? Um, and Stefan Gerard, Stephen Gerard was the most wealthy landowner in Philadelphia. His brother was also a landowner in Saint Domingue. Um, and he was able to profit off of the backs of enslaved Africans, who he then, when the Haitian Revolution started um, in the 1790s, brought his enslaved Africans to Philadelphia, which were, which were some of the original population of the Africans in the community in the city. Um, and so we think about that happening alongside that, alongside the creation of the prison system here in the United States, which founded in Philadelphia, which was the beginning of our penal system here in this country. All of those things are connected. Um, and so I thought of that as another connector, right, of the resources of this linking and mapping of funds um, and of economies, right, um, that you are identifying. And I think one of the things that was most important here in your, in your conversation around the core spaces um, was thinking about that core spaces uh, 
resources and the military mm -hmm. and thinking about the militarization and how that militarization, militarization has circled, circulated. There was a moment um, in your presentation where you mentioned that your grandparents were a part of um, yep. the group of my my to move to Cuba. Cuba. As a matter of fact, my mother was there, but she never got to uh, Cuba. Cuban Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which seems very familiar to us for what's happening right now in the DR for sure. Mm -hmm. So, do you mind just saying a little bit more about what that relationship is as well? Because you talked to us about the economy and the systems, but one of the things that came out in our panel um, before was also thinking about how this happens on the ground, right? This movement and migration is happening among families, among multiple generations. Um, I often say, like, you don't have to look very far in any Haitian family to find someone who is from Venezuela <laughs> or from Cuba or from somewhere else. So that that even idea that Haiti is, you know, located and isolated is one that is really not true when we look at family lineage. Um, so can you say a little bit more about that? Well, it is both uh, an actor but not a player in the global system, but also, I wouldn't use the word victim, but an entity, a political entity that had been dealt a very unfair hand to me. All right? Uh, the policies of both friends, America, to a certain extent Canada, vis-a-vis Haiti, the policies vis a vis Haiti have been very detrimental to Haiti becoming a self sustained uh, society. And of course, the corruption of the elite in Haiti should not be forgotten. As I said, the elite and the military were the enablers of these outside forces that penetrated into the Haitian space, displacing the population creating the situation where many, many Haitians had no alternative but to mind. And keep in mind, as I mentioned, between 1804 and 1915, there was no migration out of Haiti. Haiti was an immigrant receiving nation. Few people know that. And we received thousands, hundreds of thousands of immigrants in Haiti. Haiti was a heaven for populations who are being oppressed around the world. It is with the occupation and the destabilization of the urban, of the rural sector of Haiti, where these American entrepreneurs and investors went to Haiti to acquire land for their own interests and not the interests of the Haitian population, where the mass migration began to occur. But between 1915 and 1934, it was mostly the peasants and the urban dwellers, the low class, lower class urban dwellers who migrated. The middle class did not migrate. Of course, the upper class did not migrate. If they went to Europe, they went to study and to return. Do you know that one of the things when I watched the movie on the Titanic, the only black passenger on the Titanic was a Haitian, who was returning to Haiti from France with his French wife. His, his wife survived with her two daughters, and he perished. And I was watching the movie, and I said, you're going to show me that there was a black person on the Titanic. He never saw it. And this is what we all call erasing history silencing history, right? They show you what they want to show you, they tell you what they want to tell you, you don't know the full story. So for us to understand Haitian migration out of Haiti through the Americas and beyond, we need to understand, to analyze the true history, the true place of Haitian in the global economic system. Um. Thank you so much for that. I think one of the things that I think about when I think about Triol is also um, his article on the odd and the ordinary. And earlier in the panel, um, Dr. Dupuy mentioned that 
you know, uh, Haiti is not unique. And I think that's an important thing for us to understand in the context of understanding the global dynamic of what's happening, that the systems of labor and economics um, are things that implicate all of us as we um, saw in the previous panels. And it, it might be specific in particular what's happening in Haiti, but the militarization, the um, kinds of labor movement is being practiced, right? And that's so great to see that mapping over time, see how these rehearsals are happening um, across the region. I want to give an opportunity to open it up to the floor um, before we move into our more informal time. Um, so does anyone have any questions? Thank you so much. This, this was uh, medicine for the soul. And I hope the people who are in the room were able to really soak in the information and the knowledge that you shared um, with us. And I really hope that, um, as you say, 1804, I always say 1804 happened. And we, as a people, can create for us and can create for the world. So thank you. I just want to say thank you so much for 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 sharing this beautiful knowledge with us. I want to echo the gratitude because a lot of us who are younger scholars or newer scholars are thinking about these respective time periods, thinking about Shada, for example, and the and the displacement of um, the peasantry. We're thinking about these things and to be reminded of all the connections is just so important for those of us who are studying this time period um, to keep moving forward to make those connections. Are there any other questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you for such an amazing uh, presentation um, and for, yeah, for all the information that you shared. You mentioned at the very end that Haiti has been an actor but not the main player in the global. And I wanted to ask you if you could reflect a bit on hasn't it been or the world has refused to accept what it was, what it proposed in 1804. Um, yeah, at times I have, I feel that it was rejected in 1804, and to these days, the world hasn't been able to fathom with what Haiti has proposed to the world. Yeah, I mean, to, to quote Julio again, um, the world community has silenced the past when it comes to Haiti, because they don't want the story to be told. And they don't want the world to know the kind of treatment Haiti received on the hands of the imperialist powers. But of course, we should not forget that the Haitian elite and the military participated in that oppressive system. It is not exclusively the doing of the outsiders, because we have people in Haiti who are hand in hand, and to this day, with those outside forces to cripple the nation cripple to, de to deny the people a breathing room to live their lives in peace and in prosperity. So we have been coming from both sides. And I repeat it again, 18 made 1804, and there is a re-edition of 1804. And I'm certain of that people. I do not see it, but I'm convinced it will happen. We're going to leave space for one more question, thought, idea, connecting moment. I always tell my students your questions don't have to be fully formed. You can just give us the points <laughs> and we can do the work of helping you to connect them. Yes. Yeah. So I, I'm also moved by that last statement. Yes. And um, I think that, um, thank you, based on what you shared and we've heard today that the history has been silenced, but now we are putting forth the true narrative, we're putting forth the truth. And I think 
hopefully we will maybe be able to galvanize a significant mass of people who will be aware and more informed in that realization of what we saw and have learned about 1804 will be able to materialize into maybe a new movement because of it, because of becoming more aware and knowledgeable about the past. Again, we don't know how to move forward unless we know our history, unless we know our truth. And because it's becoming more apparent and transparent, I think that creates potential for the realization to happen as you have stated. Well, thank you. So I want to give us a chance to go to the reception and maybe have more one-on-one -on -one conversations. But I do want to return to the abstract, and I think what was the emphasis for um, Maria inviting all of us here today um, was really thinking about those moments in 2021 where we witnessed what was not new. And I think today we understand that, that, was, that those were familiar visuals. Um, and I think it's important from the previous panel, there's familiar visuals that those particular bodies those particular Black Haitian bodies, right, were being treated that way at the border. Um, and that there is a history around that um, that continues and that there's plenty of um, economic, political, labor history, but also interpersonal and political history um, that brings us to that moment. So that we need not be confused or alarmed. Uh, not, 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 we not be confused, we should be alarmed. <laughs> um, but recognize that's a repetition. And I think what we're being called to do in this space is to really intercede, stop, right, that repetition, because it keeps happening, right? We can have those spectacular moments in 2021, but the border, as Caroline is telling us, right, that these moments are still happening even though the camera crews are not there, right? Um, and so for us to just be mindful of our implication, right? We're all implicated in some way. We can't walk away from these spaces and say that we're not part of this. Um, and so for us to keep thinking through this abstract that you so beautifully crafted and really put so much energy into bringing us all here to think about this moment. So I would like for us to all thank Dr. Coral. Um, Panelists for today. Some of them are still here. I see Dr. Dupree and Caroline. I know that um, the mayor has to leave. But thank you all. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to the. Nope. No, I said Amaria especially. Oh, yes. Amaria especially. I came here as a postdoc. And I know how hard it is to integrate myself into a university space with very little understanding of what's going on. And so you've done a fantastic job. Thank you so much for all of your I truly appreciate it. Just for me as an historian of Haiti, it's appreciated um, just to think about how you were really thinking about Haiti within Latin America and not as a historical concept, right? There's something happening in the present, which is something that often happens. In our conversation. So thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Um, I think it's my responsibility now to transition us um, to the reception, um, to the cocktail period. But thank you all again for coming out today. <laughs> Thank you.